So welcome uh, to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, my name is John Ball. I'm the, the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about the RSE, it's Scotland's National Academy, a fellowship organization with approximately 1,800 fellows from all different uh, walks of life. Um, in the hopefully unlikely event um, that there's some kind of uh, emergency, then the, 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 the thing to do is to follow the instructions of the RSE staff. You go out the front and you shiver outside the, uh, the dome restaurant uh, to, your, to your right. Um, so it's, it's a great honor for today's event that, uh, to introduce Sir John Curtis, who, who will chair uh, the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, welcome to everybody, both in the room here in Edinburgh and those of you who are following uh, this event online. Uh, you are all most welcome. To a subject which I guess is probably not talked about quite so much uh, in Scotland as it is uh, south of the border, and indeed perhaps why that is the case is one of the reasons um, why uh, the uh, subject is being aired today. But of course for uh, a part of the world which is often thought to face a demographic time bomb, uh, the issue of migration and whether or not migration is or is not a potential response uh, to that uh, issue is also a subject of some considerable debate. Anyway, I've got the pleasure this evening of not having to talk at all, uh, but simply to um, introduce our speakers and to try to keep them in order. Um, first of all, uh, Christi Professor Christina Boswell from the University of Edinburgh is going to provide a bit of an introduction to the evening and about the coverage of this event. Uh, that will be followed by Do Dr. Saskia Smelly, who's going to be talking about the Bridges Project. Then we have Dr. Sarah Kayambi uh, from Migration Policy Scotland, who's going to talk about some of the attitudinal work that her organisation has done. And then finally, but by no means least, thanks to the power of the internet, uh, Professor uh, Sergei Prados, uh, Prados Prado from the University of Glasgow is also going to be talking about attitudes in Scotland. Uh, all of the principal speakers have been told they have 10 minutes, and I will be attempting to give them about a two-minute warning uh, through. So therefore, we are aiming to try and ensure that at least a half of the 90 minutes or so that we have this evening are an opportunity for you to ask questions and for us to have a bit of a uh, panel discussion. So with no more ado, I'm going to ask Christina to introduce the subject matter of the evening. So thanks very much, um, and thanks uh, to RSE for organising the event and to John for chairing. Um, so we thought it would be helpful because we've got three speakers this evening who are approaching the issue from slightly different angles, um, and we thought it would be really helpful to just provide an initial contextualisation, so sort of framing what are we trying to explore this evening. Um, so the premise of the event, and I, I hope this was clear in the sort of publicity around the, the event, was that it's often assumed that Scotland is quite distinct from the rest of the UK in terms of the politics of migration and public attitudes towards migration. And I think it's fair to say uh, this is reflected in some of the survey data, which shows that the issue is less salient, so people are not as concerned about the issue of migration compared to other types of issues. Um, all mainstream parties tend to have a generally a uh, benign attitude or a, or a positive attitude towards net migration to Scotland. Uh, it's not as prominent in the Scottish media as an issue. And I think importantly as well, it's framed in a very different way. And as John just alluded to, it's often framed in the context of uh, declining and aging population. So concerns about demographic trends, whereas in the rest of the UK and especially in England, it's predominantly framed as a labor market issue. It's about labor supply and labor shortages. So these are really important differences. So of course then that leads us as social scientists to ask why. So what are the reasons? What, are, what hypotheses might explain this difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK? And we're going to be exploring some of those uh, hypotheses, if you're happy with that word, uh, uh, this evening. Um, and some of those revolve around um, you know, the history of out-migration in Scotland, obviously 
uh, Scotland is traditionally a net sender rather than recipient of immigration, that might make a difference. Um, as I mentioned, the demographic context, so concern about ageing uh, populations and also uh, the composition of populations. So as we have a higher proportion of, of elderly in the population, that creates quite severe pressures uh, in, a, in a number of different ways. Um, there is also this question about how those sorts of factors influence public attitudes. Um, so um, do we see fundamentally different public preferences around immigration in Scotland? And does that explain that, that you know, political leaders are picking up on those differences and then reflecting that in the way they debate the issue? Um, or is it something about political dynamics, uh, which is a slightly different point? So this idea that, for example, you know, it's not a devolved competence in Scotland, so the Scottish Government doesn't actually uh, have responsibility for deciding who can come to Scotland, who can live in Scotland and who can stay in Scotland. Um, and that means that it's not held to account by opposition political parties on this issue, so there are lower incentives to mobilise public support around the issue as compared to the UK level, for example. And would that change in a scenario where Scotland was independent? Would it become a more uh, salient issue and would political parties start to mobilise around it? I can actually see John nodding uh, in the front row. I mean, there, there are relevant experiences across Europe of those sorts of uh, uh, dynamics and how immigration can quite rapidly become politicised. So we're going to address these questions from a number of different perspectives. Um, so we start with uh, Saskia, who's talking about the Bridges Project, which we were both involved in. Um, uh, and the Bridges Project is all about how narratives, stories about migration, shape uh, how we discuss and debate uh, immigration um, uh, uh, in the media, uh, how it shapes public, how na narratives shape public opinion, and how narratives then go on to influence uh, policy making. And while Bridges did focus at the UK level, um, it does raise a number of really important issues and insights into how those stories about migration and perhaps historical legacies and, and, and ways of framing the issue really do influence um, uh, uh, how, how the issue is, is sort of comes to be politicised or not. And that really provides a good starting for a uh, starting point or context for our other two presentations. So uh, the first of those presentations is from Sarah Kiambi, uh, and Sarah's organisation um, has, has done some really, really interesting um, surveys of, of public opinion around immigration issues, which have provided really important new empirical data uh, to understand differences between Scottish and rest of UK attitudes uh, towards immigration. Um, and Sergi, finally, who's joining us online, um, has done a lot of work actually uh, of direct relevance to those hypotheses I mentioned. So thinking about how different demographic trends might be affecting public attitudes and also thinking about that politicization of uh, immigration. So we'll hear from him um, as well. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll then be able to tease together those different perspectives and that you will come away from this evening with a better understanding of not just the divergences and maybe are they exaggerated or do they really exist, how pronounced are they, but also the causes, the reasons that explain why we see those divergences. And as you will appreciate, it's not a foregone conclusion. I mean, there are many different ways of explaining and accounting for those divergences. So without further ado, I will now hand over to our first speaker, Saskia. Thank you very much, Christina. So as Christina mentioned, I'm going to be discussing very briefly the Bridges Project, which uh, actually comes to an end today. Um, and hopefully this will provide a bit of context to the two subsequent presentations that really focus in on Scotland, bearing in mind that the research we did as part of Bridges focused on, focused on the UK level. Now, the Bridges Project, um, in the Bridges Project, Christina and I looked at migration narratives. So the stories we tell about migrants and the causes and consequences of immigration. We looked at six countries, the UK, France, Germany, Hungary, Italy and Spain, with research teams working in all of those countries. We looked at 36 different events or uh, migration events or episodes of intense political debate on immigration issues. And we'd coded and traced narratives in the media, in political debates, in parliament and in policy making. So if we think about migration narratives now looking at the UK context, 
Generally, narratives could be grouped into three groups. So narratives in the media talking about the consequences and impact of migration, uh, responsibility and blame around certain events, uh, uh, high inflows, etc., and the causes of immigration, push, what we call push and pull factors. So the idea that the UK might be a soft touch or that everyone wants to come to the UK because you can get a job there, etc. These reports are all online, so if you're interested in the actual content of these narratives, I'd encourage you to go to the Bridges Project and have a read. Now, some of the key findings here that I think are relevant for our debate this evening were the, is the centrality of politicians in this coverage. So the main characters or the sort of protagonists of these stories were predominantly politicians or migrants, and they tended to be either cast as, as victims or as villains. Interestingly, though, here, um, 40, uh, approximately 41% of the protagonists of these stories were politicians, where 36% were migrants. These are stories on immigration issues. We then looked at, for example, direct quotes. And in the UK case, 49% of direct quotes in the coverage were from politicians, and 13% were from migrants themselves. So you really have the, the so-called subject, perhaps, the, the, the migrants, really absent in this coverage. This also says something about media coverage in the UK around what's perceived as newsworthy. So we really had political interventions. So when a, politicians made a politician made a statement about an immigration issue, really central to the coverage on, on, uh, in the media. So if we might think of, for example, Cameron's uh, swarm of migrants quote, or this sort of sound bite that was covered diversely across, you know, all channels, uh, uh, online, on Twitter, in newspapers and so on. And regardless of whether it was uh, criticised, critically engaged with, or whether it was um, agreed with, the, the repetition of this expression, swarm of migrants, really disseminated this narrative of hordes at the gate, if you like, the idea that we were being invaded by migrants. This is just an example. We also saw that narratives tended to align with long-held established beliefs around immigration in the UK, ideas of deserving and undeserving immigration, desirable and undesirable immigration, etc. Uh, and we saw uh, that narratives in the media also tended to align aclo across uh, ideological lines. So if a, a newspaper was tended to be left-wing or right-wing, then uh, narratives aligned. Now, if we think about Scotland then, what kind of things, returning to what Christina mentioned, what kind of things do we want to think about then? So is a difference that Scotland, the Scottish media, does not engage on immigrations as much? Or as Christina also mentioned, this idea that there's perhaps more of a, a pro-immigration political consensus in Scotland, is that central given the centrality of political actors in media coverage? If we then think about narratives uh, in political debate, in parliament and in policy making, we can categorise them in much the same way. I then refer back to another report that's online. Um, here we saw the, uh, that high salient, so where the Im immigration was considered an, an important issue, led to um, a, a proliferation of narratives, so a lot of different narratives. We found that the media narratives, again, and political narratives really did completely align along ideological lines. Uh, interestingly, we also found that the media could uh, set the narrative agenda and not only negatively, as in a negative anti-immigration stance, but also could set a, a humanitarian narrative agenda. So this uh, emerged in 2015 after the image of Alan Kurdi went viral online. Uh, you saw media actively uh, set more humanitarian agenda, pushing political elites under more pressure. We also saw that on, on Ukraine. Um, there's this idea that there's perhaps a, a sort of window of opportunity. So in 2015, uh, you saw the, the parliamentary recess, you saw fewer politicians making statements on immigration issues, and the media really filled that gap. We also see the strategic deployment of narratives by politicians. This is perhaps unsurprising, but what was interesting was that we found that you could have the same narrative, and especially established narratives. The one that, that really came up a lot was the idea of the UK having a, a humanitarian tradition, that the UK is a country of refuge for asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, this was, was instrumentalized often by opposing politicians. So you really see this deployment of narratives by political actors. 
And finally, we did not find a difference in a narrative content in public political debate and in more policy coordinative venues. So we're talking here about white papers on immigration issues, uh, a home office annual reports, uh, policy documentation. So we see the same narratives really um, traveling through into policy venues. Again, if we think about Scotland now, we might want to think about then what role politicians are playing in framing uh, immigration issues and what might be different about Scotland. Is it that the media is not engaging in the same way? Is it that because of the political consensus there's less to report on, it's just less politicised, therefore not coming up in political debate and so on? Or is it simply that it's not a devolved competence, as Christina mentioned, and therefore not an issue? So I'll leave that there on the Bridges project. Now I'm going to just present some slides that hopefully provide some wider context. Um, this, these were sort of scene-setting exercises from the Bridges project, but provide context for our next two presentations. So we mentioned the word salience, the importance that the public uh, allocate to immigration as an issue. So this is Eurobarometer data uh, on what do you think are the two most important issues facing your country at the moment. And we have uh, data here on Germany, France, Hungary, Spain, the UK, and Italy. And I'm not sure how clear it is from the back there, but the red line here that starts quite high in 2012 is the UK. And then we see it peak. It's Germany at the top there. Interestingly here is to look at Hungary, uh, sorry, to look at Spain, which is the yellow line, and to look at France, which is the green line, which is relatively stable over time. If we then take a closer look at the UK, this is uh, the issue index, very similar question, immigration mentioned as the most important or other important issue facing Britain today. The blue line is most and other important issue, or and the green line is the most important issue. And here you see a real peak in salience uh, in September 2015. Uh, I included a line there around the Brexit referendum as a point of context. And then you see uh, uh, immigration as a salient issue really dropping off into 2020. We, we then see uh, uh, an increase in salience again in recent years. But let's put that into context. So in September 2015, immigration uh, was mentioned by 56% of respondents. And now in December of 2023, we're looking at 29% of respondents. It was then, bearing in mind we also looked at narratives in the media, we then looked at how salient immigration here, it's focusing on migration flows, were in the British press over time. So here again from 2012 and to, to 2022. And these are absolute numbers of articles in the Times, the Guardian and the Daily Mail referring to, to migration flows. And here you see the obvious peak in 2015 and 16. But interestingly, you see this sort of increased coverage in recent years on immigration issues. If we then look at the European Social Survey data on attitudes to immigration in the UK, so again, taking a longitudinal look, so a longer term look at attitudes, this is perhaps not what you might expect, but you can see that uh, uh, it would appear that attitudes towards immigration have become more positive since 2014. So the question here is, is the UK made or worse or a bet uh, better place to live by people coming here from other countries? And a final slide. Let's just put that into wider context of the other countries that we looked at. Here at the top left-hand corner, you've got France, then atop the, across the top, Germany, Hungary, Italy at the bottom there, Spain, and the UK here. So you actually see that attitudes overall are relatively stable and are becoming uh, more positive in many countries, although in Italy and Hungary they were more negative in 2016, but generally becoming a little bit more positive, but notably UK here is considerably more positive over time. And I'll leave it there. Please take a look at our Bridges website um, to find all the data, all the reports. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. That was not only interesting, but it was perfectly timed. Um, and you've set a brilliant example for the rest of the evening. Um, so um, Saskia's shown us not only talked about Scotland and about uh, the UK more broadly, but she even got as far as Hungary. Sarah's going to bring us back home now um, and to look at how attitudes in Scotland compare with the rest of the UK. Sarah. 
Thank you. Um, yes, it's formidable timekeeping, but also just really, really interesting uh, project and interesting, interesting work. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading some of that when I'm not trying to worry about what I'm going to say next. Um, so, um, as Christina mentioned, uh, I, I run Migration Policy Scotland. We're a third sector organisation um, set up to, um, to try and build capacity on migration policy in Scotland. And that's both to build more capacity, but also to equip it by uh, building um, the kind of data and evidence that we need to put some of that work on a more rational, um, thoughtful footing. Um, and that really is the, the mission at MPS. Um, and so it's really, it's really delightful today to be able to tell you a little bit about the attitude survey, which forms a, a sort of a cornerstone of that kind of effort. Now, why did we, why did we set up MPS? Um, we set it up because we believe that migration is of rising importance for Scotland um, and that there needed to be um, for some of the reasons Christina mentioned, like the demographics, um, some of the, the mentions around like the political divergence and that complexity. And we thought really there was a need, a growing need for an organization that can help coordinate actors, um, drive better informed discussion and dialogue, and create pieces of what I'm thinking of as um, a piece of insight infrastructure, which is what we think this survey is intended to become. So we have... We, we last year had the first round of our attitude survey. Um, and so it is really in the early stages of development. And I would say attitudinal data is, is much more helpful for comparing trends that rather than isolated figures. So I don't, I think we should be cautious about what meaning we attribute to what we have here so far. And I also want to say that, that from our view, you know, attitudinal data is not there to tell policymakers what to do. It's there to inform policymakers about where publics are. I think the calculations within making policy on this matter require much more uh, broader thinking around the trade-offs, the interrelationships than you can get from this kind of polling data. That said, and I will skip over this quickly because I think Saskia has settled some of the, the context. We do. I did want to say that we do have a had a rising uh, warming of attitudes, and the second slide, the second. Um, Graphic here is the UK topping the World Value Survey, a uh, list of 17 countries reported on here, in terms of um, both being less inclined to prevent people coming here or to set strict limits on um, migration. Now, that data was collected in 2022, but just reported on, I think, last month. Um, but it, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, now, I think it's, it's useful when thinking about attitude data to step back a little bit and think about what correlates with positive views on migration. And we know from research that you know, views sit on a spectrum, and on either end you may have views that are not, not open to much persuasion. But actually what you have is a majority who sit in the middle who are persuadable, and particularly if you do the kind of work I do where we try to engage with publics and others on migration, those are the people that we're interested in and we're trying to understand what they think, why they think it, what the scope for action is therefore in terms of what can we do on, on migration that feels um, like it, it addresses both the benefits that migration offers but also the challenges that it, it may set. Um, so there I would say um, we know that there is a degree of consistency in what shapes people's attitudes and therefore you might not think um, where, where both younger age groups, people with higher qualifications, people of higher social groups, people who are more urban and have more contacts with migrants, generally have more positive attitudes. And in our survey, we found exactly that as well. Um, so our survey finds the same kind of underlying factors. Um, but what is in our survey, and I'll just skip over this. So we had eight questions. So this is still a very small survey, but it's, it's a representative sample of over 1,000. And we focused on awareness and support for migration, perceived impacts of mig immigration, and social contact. And you can read the report on our website if you Google Migration Policy Scotland. So what did we find? Um, I think the first uh, is, is the pie charts show, show the, the NPS survey results from last year. Um, and what we found um, is that in our survey, the, the Scottish public 
was um, the large proportion of respondents actually favoured an increase over a reduction in the number of migrants coming to the UK. Um, and that's an increase, like, so on the other side is, is the immigration tracker that shows you a UK result for the same question. And you can see there that, that the level wanting an increase were more positive. Um, and the level favouring a decrease was significantly less negative. I think that's a very interesting result. Um, and again, it's also very interesting because this differed greatly from the, the Cantor Migration Observatory polling that was done uh, late last year, where we had a, as high as 52 favouring a reduction in migration with just 14% favouring an increase. It's also really interesting because it shows change over time. Um, it reverses a finding from a decade ago where actually 58% supported of the Scottish public supported a decrease uh, in Scotland. Um, so from this data, so we think this is, a very, this is a very interesting finding, but I think, again, it's the first finding, and we need to see how this emerges. It may be explained by other factors, such as the, that our survey was considerably earlier in the year last year than these, these surveys that came through in the autumn. So it might be that we had not caught quite as much of that returning um, uh, upswing of concern, uh, more negative concern about migration. The next uh, set of data that we have is around the perceived income. And again, here in our survey, we found significant difference between our survey data and that for UK-wide data in the immigration tracker. Um, our, and again, our report compares this also with the Cantor Media, uh, the Cantor and Migration Observatory report, and the 2014 survey, where again, you see a, a, a similar picture. So we had more, uh, more being positive um, in terms of seeing imp the impacts as positive rather than negative. That's different to what the immigration track has. has where, um, But what is really interesting in our data, again, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hold too much store by these differences. These surveys are done at different points in time. They're all in the same year, but they're in different points in time. I, I, I wouldn't I'd be cautious about comparing them too directly. What I do think is really interesting is that we asked the question on impact both at Scotland level and at local area level. And we found that our results at local area level were far more muted than they were at national level. And by national, I mean Scotland. Um, so they, they were more or less the same, but they were more muted. And that, that's really interesting because it reverses what we'd seen in attitudinal data about a decade ago, where generally local level responses in UK surveys tended to be more positive than national level um, responses. And I thought on a you know, talk about narratives that that's really interesting because it seemed at that time, you know, one of the hypotheses about how you would explain that is to say, well, is it that media narratives give you the sense that migration is something really to be worried about, but at a local level, you think, well, actually, I don't feel worried. Whereas, potentially, you have the opposite going on in Scotland, where media narratives or political narratives are more positive, and yet at local level, maybe people don't really quite see um, what they think. But, um, so, um, but I think, again, it's a very early stage. And, but just to run through some of this impact data, so we asked around different both positive and negatively framed impacts, and I think here that, that was randomised in the survey, and I think what's really interesting is people tended to agree with positive statements about impact, but they also tended to disagree about with negative statements around impacts. So we think this is really, um, that that's an indication that this is really, people are thinking about their answers. Um, and we get really consistent results. And what's really interesting here, for instance, is to the, both the um, helping to fill jobs for which it's hard to find workers. I mean, we have 75% um, either strongly agreeing or tending to agree on that. That's very strongly positive. Um, but also a question that we introduced that hasn't really been asked in other surveys that I'm aware of, which is migration brings new people to areas which need them. Where again, over, um, so that's 59% positive on that. And that really changes the idea that we had previously that potentially understanding the contribution migration can make to facing demographic challenges is something that's really more of an elite narrative than something that a general public understand. I think certainly that result makes me feel like people think, think that far more, in a far more widespread way. Um, so, so I think that's, that's really encouraging 
in terms of thinking about is some of that messaging permeating? I mean, it, it's not, not a long time ago that where we thought the best research evidence we had essentially stated that that was an elite narrative that didn't really permeate. Um, but also on the negative, oh, that's my phone. <laughs> Switched off. Everything switched off. That is, anyway. So, and again, so we on, on negative aspects tend to disagree. But I think I want to end on this slide as well, which I think is is interesting when you consider what attitudes to migration mean. So we were also asking about um, people's attitudes to diversity, and we see very strongly that people are positive about seeing migration. You know, having different people living in an area makes it an enjoyable place to live and they, that they disagreed with wanting to live in an area with people of the same ethnic background and believing that diversity is good for Scotland. And I think those responses need to be taken um, together with the other response to one of the questions. Only 46% 40, um, of our survey respondents actually saw themselves as, ha as having no social contact with immigrants. So while in most places we see that, that social contact tends to create more positive um, uh, views about migration, that can't really be the case with much of Scotland. And yet we are seeing strongly positive views. And I think that's really, that's really, really interesting. And it's something that we hope to, um, as our survey develops, that we can investigate um, further both those issues, but also as we go forward to a time where you know, migration to Scotland is rising. We're expecting it to go to areas of Scotland um, that had not experienced migration before. So I think it's, it's incredibly significant that actually we seem to be seeing positive um, views it, to a greater extent than seems to be correlated to the amount of experience of migration. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's the most innovative way I've known a speaker claim a bit of extra time for their talk. But anyway, um, she's clearly asked, she clearly asked, uh, asked somebody to phone a friend. Um, so anyway, thank you, Sarah. That was very, very interesting. Uh, now, this is the moment when, as a chair, you go nervously and you hope that the technology is going to work. Ah, there is Sergey. Um, so, Sergey, uh, welcome to uh, this evening's event, and thank you for joining us. Um, Sergey, I should warn you that um, I will endeavour to give you about a two-minute warning, about two minutes towards the end, okay? Um, but uh, Sergey, as Christina said earlier, is um, at the University of Glasgow. He's going to be talking about attitudes in Scotland. He's also, just so you know, he's a member of the Migration Advisory Committee, which is responsible for advising the UK government about migration policy, though, of course, doubtless, he will say straight away, that the UK government doesn't always follow the advice that the Migration Advisory Committee gives it. But anyway, Sergey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I hope you, you can hear me well. If the, if the chair is anxious about technology, I cannot even begin to tell you how the speaker feels about, about all this. Uh, but in any case, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, Yes, so uh, attitudes uh, to migration in Scotland. So if I could just summarize what I'm going to be developing in the next uh, 10 minutes. So it sounds like levels of pro-immigration sentiment uh, in Scotland are higher. And this is, of course, an incredibly interesting finding. Uh, and then when, when listening to Sarah and when listening to Saskia, the Bridges Project and all the great work that Migration Policy Scotland is doing, you know, it seems to be uh, leading to this kind of finding. And then what I was trying to do was to delve a little bit deeper, not so much into the level, but into the distribution of this immigration sentiment across social groups. In other words, is Scottish society homogeneous in this sort of like uh, uh, pro-immigration sentiment, or are there the well-known divides over immigration uh, uh, also present? And then uh, the first conclusion of this, of this little presentation is that while the levels of pro-immigration sentiment are high, the well-known divides over immigration across educational groups, age groups, etc., are also there. 
right? Which is very consistent with uh, the recent data that Sarah was also presenting, right? So anyways, this leads to a puzzle, right? So those potential latent divides over immigration are there. Why are they not more politicized? And then these are the three hypotheses that I wanted to rehearse with you and perhaps to be uh, developed a little bit more during Q&A. One potential hypothesis is that the territorial conflict is somewhat absorbing the immigration conflict. Hypothesis two, it depends a little bit on the framing of the survey question that we use. And sometimes depending on how we ask on which aspect of migration, uh, sometimes we get slightly different answers. And hypothesis three, which connects perhaps a little bit more with the work that I've been doing with my colleagues at the Migration Advisory Committee, uh, immigration, uh, perhaps surprisingly, is really not a massive demographic phenomenon in Scotland yet. And also we didn't find evidence of downward pressure uh, uh, on wages because of immigration. So in other words, perhaps we're talking about a demographic and economic phenomenon that is unusually uh, low threat, so to speak, in Scotland uh, for, the time, for the time being. So uh, as for the first part of this uh, sort of like little outline, I'm not gonna go too much into detail about it because Sarah was summarizing this very, very well. But essentially this is a graph telling us that divides over immigration are there, right? So this is basically a set of regression coefficients trying to predict negative views over the cultural impact of immigration in Scotland on the basis of uh, data from the Scottish election study 2021, which is a huge project that we that we uh, host at the University of Glasgow. And the pattern is exactly the same uh, as what uh, Migration Policy Scotland data was, was telling us. No? So for example, if you look at uh, you know regression coefficients uh, uh, of of different age groups on the on the on the top of this graph. Uh, values towards the right mean that belonging to this uh, social group increases negative attitudes towards immigration. And essentially, the first uh, sort of like point estimates are telling us that compared to the youngest in our society, each age group, each older age group, is a bit more anti-immigrant than the youngest one. Uh, if you focus, for example, on university degree, surprise, surprise, highly educated people are less anti-immigrant than uh, sort of like people without a university degree and more modest but statistically significant and actually relevant relationships between immigration sentiment and income levels compared to the lowest quintile in uh, income in Scotland, middle high and high income levels tend to be more positive towards immigration, tend to reduce anti-immigration sentiment. Anyways, this is a spectacularly boring graph for anybody uh, sort of like following uh, attitudes towards immigration because it's the same graph that I could show if you're looking at uh, British data, Italian data, French data, or Spanish data. So while we see perhaps an unusually positive level of pro-immigration sentiment in Scotland, the divides are actually there and we have good evidence that they are not negligible in magnitude and very highly significant from a statistical sort of like perspective. So what's going on? Why are they so latent? Why are we not talking more about them and so on? No. One potential hypothesis, which is not contradictory with so many other hypotheses, is that the territorial conflict, this identity conflict, this us versus them sort of thing, is very much a, very much driven by the constitutional divide or, or, or conflict, if you will, uh, and not so much and not so much by the by the immigration debate as such, no. And in other words, the two things have uh, aligned with one another, especially post Brexit. So here you see average levels of anti-immigrant sentiment over the economic impact of immigration on the left graph, or the cultural impact of immigration on the on the right graph, still on the basis of Scottish election study data. And here you see a very significant correlation uh, uh, of anti-immigrant sentiment across partisan groups or across groups of voters, with green voters and SNP voters being remarkably more positive uh, towards immigration. Now, this realignment is relatively recent in history, because when looking at uh, the uh, immigration item that we had in the earlier Scottish election study in 2016, higher values mean, uh, once again, more negative attitudes towards immigration. Here, the differences were actually not significant at all, at least not when comparing Scottish Nationalist Party voters with lib Liberal Democrats and also with Labour, right? So these differences have accentuated at a very rapid speed post-Brexit, showing that immigration and territorial identities can actually realign very quickly and they are very context dependent. 
Interestingly, this is something that we've seen in the context of Catalonia. And then people are going to be like, what is, why is this guy talking about Catalonia now? Apart from the fact that he's connecting from there right now. But, you know, I thought it's a relatively comparable uh, case for, for so many obvious uh, reasons. Um, but also just to, just to, just to uh, sort of like tell you, and, and I have more graphs to prove this point, but because of the very short presentation, last decade, during the maximum level of territorial confrontation between the pro-independence movement and the, and the central government, the central state, positive immigration attitudes were very much correlated with Catalan national identity, similar to what's happening in Scotland right now. However, in the context of a bit of a generalized sort of like disaffection of the movement, because in a generalized perception that the independence pushes over, uh, there's a new radical right party that made it in the last local elections, gaining representation in some city councils. And anti-immigrant attitudes on the basis of a survey that came out last week among Catalan identities went up by 30%, by 30%, which is a huge change in public opinion, uh, uh, you know, from one trimester to the other, right? It reminded me of what happened in Quebec when the Parti Québécois lost a bit that push for independence after those two referenda in the 1990s, and they became actually much more anti-immigrant uh, later on. Scottish nationalism, as we know, has evolved itself towards more civic versions of nationalism since the, since the 80s onwards. So in other words, the relationship between immigration and territorial divides seems to be very volatile and context dependent. There's nothing in the DNA of a particular national identity that will make it more or less pro-immigration. This is very much driven by these elite framings that Saskia was talking about and that Sarah was, was referring to as well. And they are very much context dependent. In maximum confrontation with the central government, it looks like peripheral national identities, if I can call them like this, using sort of like political science terminology, they tend to see immigration more as an ally. But whenever the circumstances in the territorial debate change, immigrants can also be seen as a threat very, very quickly. You know? So this is a bit of a cautionary tale in a way for what could happen also, uh, 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 you know, in terms of Scottish politics. So one hypothesis, what, uh, you know, the territorial confrontation and divides, uh, and I'm aware that I'm, I'm, I'm approaching the, my last two minutes or, or minute and a half. But in any case, uh, the a second hypothesis is that sometimes respondents uh, show different attitudes depending on how you frame uh, the debate. Now, newer research seems to suggest that the public differentiates very well between what in policymaking we call external regulation. So who gets in and why and how many migrants are allowed from internal regulation. So the migrants, the, the rights that migrants are granted once in the destination country and the impact that migrants have, right? So those two things that are very present in the policymaker mind seem to be relatively present in the respondent of public opinion mind which means that considering immigration good for, or for your economy or for your cultural life does not mean that you agree with increasing immigration uh, uh, as such, as a demographic phenomenon, right? And then, for example, if we look at the item that was available in the 2016 Scottish election study, which is, of course, probably spectacularly outdated because it happened before the big realignment that we witnessed uh, post-Brexit, but almost 48.5% of people would strongly disagree and disagree across Scotland that increasing immigration uh, 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 was a good idea, right? So th th this is a substantial shift, probably very much driven by asking about this inflow. Even if Sarah was now telling us that perhaps recently this attitude has softened, has softened as well. And then finally, the third hypothesis, perhaps a bit more connected with uh, the work that we've been doing at the MAC, uh, we were trying to analyze what is the probability of observing economic migration uh, 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 or, or sort of like uh, certificates of sponsorship, as we call it, uh, uh, according to the terminology of the new immigration system, as a function of, you know, the region or nation in the UK that we were observing this economic migration. And surprisingly to me, as an immigrant living in Scotland, you know, a wonderful place to settle, uh, when compared to London, which is the region, or in this case, the city attracting most immigration uh, into the UK, as you would imagine, Scotland was the lowest, the least likely nation in the UK to observe migration. So in other words, you know, compared to any other region or nation, Scotland receives way fewer economic migrants than the others. Then what we try to do is to try to explain this, you know, huge disparity uh, 
uh, with wages structures. Maybe in Scotland you earn less, not at all. Wages structures and wage levels in Scotland are actually um, you know, quite high, comparatively speaking, now in the UK. Uh, right, and then I'm finishing with this. So essentially, demographic pressure uh, and immigration flows into Scotland are actually quite small. And therefore, uh, the economic and potential demographic threats are relative, relatively slim, decreasing the saliency of this topic. I'm going to leave it there. We're just throwing ideas, hopefully, to be picked up later on in the Q&A. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, thank you, Sergey. Thank you for, so much for being so uh, self-disciplined. Could I invite the three panelists who are physically here to come up um, onto the stage? Um, and we now go into the Q&A. Um, if you've got a question, just do that thing that you learned to do at school and put your hand up. Um, but the one thing you probably didn't learn to do at school was to make sure you waited for the microphone before you articulated your question. Um, but because we are streaming this, that's actually quite important, otherwise you won't be heard. Those of you who are online, if you, are inter if you want to uh, pose a question, please put it into the chat and it will be articulated for you from within this room. Um, but in a good time-honoured fashion, I'm going to start off by exercising Chair's privilege to ask the first question. Now, in his presentation, Sergei declared himself to be a migrant to Scotland. The question I want to ask is, am I, as I, am, as I, am I also a migrant to Scotland? <laughs> when we talk about migration to Scotland, in other words, should we simply be talking about migration from outside the United Kingdom? Or is actually the migration issue in Scotland inevitably a different one because it's not just about migration from outside the UK, it's also about the ability of people like myself to exercise freedom of movement to move from England to Scotland. Um, so, um, I think in terms of international migration, clearly not at present. Um, but at the same time, I, I think what I find very what I use as a rule of thumb in trying to determine what, what kind of definition of migrant to use is often what, what is the challenge I'm trying to address, either in a piece of research or in a piece of policy work. So I think there are circumstances in which if we were talking about bringing people to Scotland to address demographic issues, that, that would encompass people that we might be bringing from other parts of the UK at the mm -hmm. moment in terms of... Sorry, and I'm thinking about this very much. I'm, I'm a... You know, I, I work in policy... So I'm thinking about it in terms of a problem. And in, within that problem, I might be looking at, you know, people from, from the rest of the UK and looking at kind of encouraging that kind of mobility. Um, so I, I tend to tailor how I'm trying to define migration in, in terms of what, what, what the underlying issue is that but, we're trying but, to address. But, but why, why, is, why, are the, why are the underlying issues different about migrants coming from outside the UK as opposed to from... Is coming from within the UK. I mean, I'm I'm happy to build on that a bit. I mean, I absolutely agree with Sarah that that it you know classifications partly depend on legal definitions, partly on policy definitions, but also crucially on how the issue is constructed as a problem uh, or as a benefit. Yeah, but as academics, uh, so, we, we, so, we, we, wait, we, de wait. we we deliberately yeah. try to deconstruct yeah. these things. Yeah, yes? absolutely. So 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 I guess the issue, for example, if it's defined, and here we come to narratives, of course. If it's narrated, if the story is about, say, welfare, who is entitled to access welfare, uh, and that's often been a, a lens through which immigration sure. is considered, quite often there are assumptions about, say, UK nationals having privileged access to welfare vis-a-vis non-nationals, or it might be an issue, some people might believe, the length of stay and residency in the UK should determine access to welfare. So whether you're constructed as a a migrant who is or isn't entitled to access those sorts of resources might depend on those fault lines. Uh, for other uh, forms of debate or other narratives, it might be an ethnicity issue. So uh, traditionally, many countries have defined who is a member in terms of their racial identity or sure. an e ethnicity or religion. Mm -hmm. uh, so there again, you might, um, you know, in, in the context of yourself, John, uh, many people might say, oh, well, John's not a migrant because he's 
he's white and he, you know, he's from from mm, from sure. England and mm -hmm. not from a you know country which is traditionally constructed as an, a sort of othered in certain respects. So that's another answer. Uh, and alternatively, if it's seen as a demographic issue, uh, certain populations that don't say contribute demographically might be considered as more problematic, and that by, might be neutral across those other dimensions okay. we just me mentioned. So, I mean, this is just to unpack how that narrative can shape who is seen as a migrant yeah, but, and but, why that's but, problematic. But, 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 but Sergey, um, when it comes to the kind of survey questions that you've been presenting, how do we know what people understand who are answering that survey? What do they understand by the term migration? Can we be actually sure that they necessarily mean migration from outside the UK? Yeah, I think it's a very relevant question. And I think the honest answer is we don't fully know, John. And I think that you're, you're, you're tapping into something very interesting. I mean, the definition of migration is basically someone who's born in a different country. And then the word country here can be sort of like ambiguous, right? Uh, and that it's, uh, you know, uh, coming to the destination place for relatively permanent, in a relatively permanent time frame. And here in the UK, we officially define that as one year. But one year, two years, three years. Um, but I think it is not far. So I think that there's two answers to this. One of them is the uh, how people understand the word migrant in questions. And I think that Saskia and Christina had a lot of interesting things to say about these narratives, these constructions, etc. I think it's not completely far fetched to suspect that they are not thinking of you in a way and that they are thinking more of me <laughs> uh, in those questions. But this is just an assumption that I cannot prove. And I think you're totally right. The second part of the answer, and if I could share uh, something, would be the demographic bit. And I'm just sharing something very briefly from the MAC annual report 2022, when we saw that there's a bit of a paradox. So on the one hand, population is projected to decline in Scotland because of, you know, this, this negative natural growth, as we were uh, discussing. But net cross-border migration, meaning people, pe people like John, <laughs> essentially, that is projected to increase in Scotland, according to ONS estimates, right? So while Scotland is going to be a demographic loser in the long run in the coming decades, it's actually going to be a winner of intra-UK migration, which is a slightly different aspect of what you're asking. Okay, all right. I just thought I'd deliberately ask an awkward question, but anybody who knows me <laughs> knows I'll do that. Right, do we have some questions in the room, please? Can I take the lady first and then the gentleman next to her, please? Sure. Is it, just please wait for the microphone. Um, I just wanted to um, make a comment on the previous, um, uh, the previous discussion around, uh, you know, who is a migrant and sure. who isn't. And I just, uh, because um, I just wonder by not being clear about who we mean when we do our research, um, we... Uh, sort of other the, mi the international migrant even further. And would it be helpful if we looked at migration and looked at internal and international migration together in some cases, depending on what the fo focus is, to break down this issue that there aren't commonalities or differences between them? Because I think, you know, I'm thinking about rural okay. areas and... Um, um, I know that the word white settlers are used. They're seen as migrants quite often. And, and that can be a very contentious issue. There, were, there was a sort of anthropological study done many years ago looking at that issue. And I think there's a, there's a sort of blind spot in academic discussions around this. And I know that there are academics who okay. actually argued very strongly that we should look at it. All so right, that's kind of the okay. point that Thanks I'd like to... Thanks very much. I should perhaps also declare, having been born and brought up about Cornwall, I thought, can also tell you about attitudes towards people who come into the county from across the River Tamar as well. Um, but Saskia, I wonder if you could just pick this up for a moment, because, um, you know, I, mean, I, I know this wasn't the focus of your research, but when you look at the narratives that we tell about narratives in Scotland, do we in fact talk, do we make the distinction or do we in fact often in these discussions talk about both migration from within the UK as well as migration from outside the UK? I mean, that's, that was unfortunately a little bit beyond what we studied in, in Bridges, but what, what I perhaps 
can say is that um, there were no narratives that appeared in the British media now at the UK level yeah. or in Parliament that brought up demographic issues, that brought up different regions, okay. unless it was the arrival of small boats on the, on the, on the south coast. So if we're thinking about the problem definition, if we're thinking about internal movement or, or international migration, the focus was absolutely international without sure. any exception. Yeah, I don't think too many people in England are worried about being swamped by hordes from Scotland. But anyway, <laughs> we're just a wee bit too small, the gentleman here. Hi there, Chris Murray from COSLA. Uh, really interesting. I want to ask you about uh, whether or not we should be careful of treating Scotland as one homogenous whole, because I wonder if different parts are very different migration stories. You know, Glasgow has had lots of low-skill immigration from Ireland or the subcontinent, but over a very long time. Edinburgh is now slated to become more diverse than Glasgow. Uh, the Highlands have seen like labour shortage uh, levels of migration in recent years. Um, and also we're seeing a big demographic shift in Scotland from the West Coast to the East Coast. And the areas that are depopulating are on the West Coast and the areas that are seeing rapid population growth, Midlothian, East Lothian, around Edinburgh, are seeing that not from migration, but from people moving within the UK. So I wonder if, if we drill down into those questions, does that start telling us that the different hypotheses apply differently in, Scot in different parts of Scotland? Perhaps Sarah and then I'll ask Sergey, yeah? Um, I think, uh, sorry, that's a, that's a great question. And you're right, you know, that we are at a, we're actually at a really interesting moment in terms of Scottish, Scotland's migration story with, you know, with, with a change with where people are coming from, but also lots of internal change. Um, and I think certainly in the data that we have, I mean, you can see that there was a limit about how much, how granular an analysis one could do. Um, but in the, the next round of the survey, which went into the field uh, last uh, earlier this month, um, we have doubled the sample size. We have also a few more questions. And that, that will increase the scope for, for more kind of geographic location analysis. So I'm, I'm very excited about that as we go forward um, to try and understand better how that changes, but also to really stress the need to understand that better, because I think we have a, that there is a risk with all this change and a, a changing future. And I think some of what, what Sergey has about, you know, the, the idea, the data about where migration is going to under the skilled worker visa, we are at a time of incredible change. Um, some of which will be, you know, bringing change migrants into parts of Scotland that haven't seen them before. Certainly, we think we're going to see a change in in the complexion of migrants, far more visible minorities in those inflows. Um, and I and I think that it's really important to, that we manage to stay ahead of that. And while we've had a remarkably positive story over the last twenty years, not to take that for granted. Because Sarah, isn't that? Uh, sorry, I'll come to you tomorrow. Isn't that? That isn't just a point. that's true of Scotland. It's also true of the UK as a whole. Because, as it were, one of the ironies of the fallout from Brexit was that while we tightened the rules for people coming into the UK from the European Union, we actually liberalised the rules for people coming from outside the European Union. And of course, what's happened is that as a result, we are seeing, although uh, migratory flows in the European Union are lower than they were before Brexit, migratory flows from outside the European Union have now grown, which is why Brexit has not delivered what people are expecting. But it does mean that as a result, we now have, in terms of ethnic and religious origins, we now are getting a more diverse form of immigration than we had before uh, 2020, which was probably not what mostly voters were expecting to happen. But anyway, but, it's, but, but it does therefore pose you know, broader challenges uh, uh, to the United Kingdom. Sergey, do you, have you got any thoughts yes. about within Scotland variation? Yeah, no, that was a that was a great question. I mean, some some of the flows that the that the the gentleman was referring to were tapping into an urban rural kind of divide, no, and 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 that kind of internal flow. Uh, if it is true that migration is going to more uh, urban settings like Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, you know, I don't think that's necessarily going to result in a sort of like negative turn in in immigration attitudes because we know that urban settings tend to be on average more positive towards immigration. And this is partly because there's a bit of a self-selection of local populations, you know, more cos the cosmopolitan type for some reason tends to go to live in cities and, 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 and the opposite and the opposite might happen in some in some rural areas. Uh, 
We also know that um, immigration is not perceived as a threat when the labor market is doing is doing well. You know, in places with high demand, in thriving economies, immigrants are not necessarily perceived as a threat. And and the third reason, what I would suspect, this this kind of inequality wouldn't necessarily change the pattern that we're seeing, is that uh, sometimes positive attitudes, and something that Sarah was saying as well, positive attitudes are seen in places where more contact with migrants uh, uh, can be seen. No, sometimes you see more negative attitudes in places where actually there's no immigration at all. No, so that kind of inequality, it's true, is there in terms of uh, you know internal Scottish flows. However, they seem to be tapping into this urban-rural divide that shouldn't change the overall pattern we've been describing up until now. Christina or Saskia, did you want to come in on this particular subject? Fine, okay, you're happy to sit, right. Yes, we've got a question from uh, outside the room. Yes, we do. We've got one from uh, online, um, and that's coming from uh, Agnieszka, who has said, what is the difference between migrant communities and ethnic minorities? When do we start referring to them as different groups? Christina, it might be one for you to start with, given we've already started talking about definitions of migrants. Yeah, so um, migrants are typically, we, well, we typically refer to them as first-generation migrants, so they're the people that have actually moved country uh, um, and, um, uh, and, and the definition is, you know, if you're a migrant, you, you will have relocated internationally um, for more than 12 months, as, as Sergey mentioned. Um, now... Uh, over time, you might then naturalize and become a citizen of your uh, country of destination, for example, um, and, and then um, you, know, you, you would be a national of that country. Uh, you might still see yourself or others might still see you as a migrant, but uh, then f f for both you and then for your children, for the next generation, what we call second and then third generation uh, migrants, we do use that terminology, typically uh, that grouping is more likely to be labelled as a, a, an ethnic minority group or an ethnic group uh, rather than as migrants because they are not the ones who have actively moved uh, in their lifetime. So I guess that's how I would generally answer the question. I don't know whether others would, would want to nuance that or introduce any variation to that to that broad response. No. Um, I mean, I guess it does raise that issue which Sergei touched on. It's interesting, Sergei, you mentioned some recent German research saying that people have quite different attitudes towards incomers, so new arrivals, uh, versus uh, uh, ethnic minority groups um, or sort of second or third or fourth generation migrants who settled uh, a, a long time ago. Uh, in, in the country of origin, or might, be, might, might go back centuries as, a, as an ethnic minority in, in, that, in that country. I mean, I, it's interesting. I, I, I don't think that's very surprising or new in the UK context, where um, in terms of political discourse, since the 1960s, there has been this clear distinction in the way political parties talk about and mobilise around immigration issues between what we do about newcomers and how many more people we want coming into our country and settling in our country vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. what's often termed integration. So what we do um, or, or how we deal with issues around assimilation or integration or issues of diversity uh, for, for those who have settled, been settled for a long time and their children and their grandchildren and so on. And typically, uh, mobilizationists tend to feel safer around newcomers uh, than it has around mobilizing around ethnic minorities who are permanently resident, are settled, etc. And that's partly because it's seen as potentially provoking forms of discrimination and racism and creating all sorts of potential social divisions and problems if we start stirring up uh, negative attitudes towards those who've been settled for a long time in the UK and are clearly members and are British citizens and nationals. Good, because there's also, of course, because a crucial feature of a lot of migration into the UK is that they arrived with citizen rights thanks to the 1948 British Nationality Act, which is a wonderful piece of freedom of movement within the, within the Commonwealth. And that, that, that's, that's important. So once they're here, they have votes and they therefore have leverage, political leverage. So uh, did you want to come in, Sarah? Um, yeah, I mean, just to, to maybe build on that and potentially this is where the question is going and it, it, it links into your opening question as well. Um, I mean, while these two categories in a way are distinct, of course, the way people respond to surveys and so on is, you know, often people have very mixed views and cannot tell, uh, you know, you, you often you can't tell by looking. Um, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, you know, and, and but also that, that, you, that sometimes, uh, you know, views 
on migration are and, and, and the politics on migration is, is used as a, as a dog whistle for politics on race. Um, and that, that obviously plays out quite differently maybe in Scotland where, you know, the last 20 years of freedom of movement maybe hasn't had that so much of that dimension in it, even though I think it will have to, had to some degree um, with people coming mainly from Central and Eastern Europe. So I think, I think there's a lot, you know, these, these things, these issues, they're complex and overlapping. Um, and I think particularly at a time when they are changing so significantly, it feels very important to try and so, okay. get on top of them. Yes, thank you. No, just to just to agree with many of the things that Christina was saying, I think the selection plus integration nexus is an important one. Uh, and indeed, it has been a driving force in, in British immigration policy making on immigration matters. And now we're discovering that it also matters for public opinion. No? So the research that I mentioned in passing is showing us uh, by Helbling and, 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 and colleagues in, uh, in Mannheim University and other German universities, they are telling us that basically for people with a negative predisposition towards immigration, um, this uh, policy combination of a hard border, but an inclusive, more softer sort of like uh, insight of the immigration system is something that they are ready to agree with. No? However, uh, the, the external regulation needs to be harder. And this is one of the potential expl explanations why, at, as, as, as some of you highlighted, why attitudes in the UK, paradoxically, according to some people, have softened after Brexit. Because this idea that immigration was controlled and that now we, we have control over our borders kicked in and then some people uh, sort of relaxed. However, we'll see how this pans out in the future when people realize what John was saying, uh, that actually we have more net migration than ever and it's going to be more diverse than ever. No, But that's going to be a different issue. Okay, right. Do we have any more questions in the room, please? Right, can I take the gentleman towards the back and then I'll take the gentleman who's further forward. Thank you. Really interesting so far. Um, my question relates to the definition of an immigrant and that potentially the, the definition that Scottish people have is different to the people in the rest of the UK. So, for example, in Scotland, you might consider someone from England or maybe Northern Ireland as an immigrant, whereas people from England may not think that people from Scotland are. So maybe that shapes the difference in attitudes between Scotland and the rest of the UK that we see that people coming from England or Northern Ireland is positive. So we see people coming from beyond the UK also as positive, and that maybe it doesn't work the same way if you're in England. And that potentially the same reason going for Brexit that people maybe voted. Not really understanding the issue and the definition, for example, voting for Brexit because they didn't like immigration from outside the EU and not understanding that Brexit was only issues within the EU. Um, yeah, that's me. Okay, that's an interesting point of view, that it's because of people like me that people in Scotland are therefore happy with people who come from outside the UK. Anybody want to respond to that? I mean, I, I, have, I have seen the argument put in, in, I believe it was in Brexit land, around that, that the, diffi the difference in Scotland is, is that the other is the English. Um, rather than the migrant, if you see what I mean. So that, that's your other, that, that kind of is excluded and somehow, um, you know, kind of cast yeah. dispersions upon. But this, but this takes us to a crucial point that Sergei mentioned in his talk, which is the character of the nationalist movement in Scotland, right? And that, you know, you can argue that some of the least small end nationalism that you see in England, and certainly this has been argued by people like Elsa Henderson, um, uh, tends to be ethnocentric, in its conception, i.e., you're interested in primary, you're, you're interested in, in wanting to have a country where you have people that are ethnically similar to you. Uh, Scotland has always has this civic conception of, of Scotland, and the SNP are quite happy to have me so long as I'm willing to live here and stay here. Um, and that, therefore, as a result, you've, it comes back to elite level discourse, which we've talked about the, throughout this evening, which is that the character of uh, public attitudes isn't necessarily simply a function of people's education or uh, their experience, etc., but it's also a function of the discourse within which they operate, and that because the Nationalist Party in Scotland is very much a civic movement, and is uh, frankly quite touchy about any suggestion that it's in any way anti-English or in any way ethnocentric, uh, that you therefore get a very different kind of discourse. But anyway, yes, Saskia. Um, could I just? build on what you've what you've sure. just shared because that certainly played out in the narratives emerging in parliamentary debate um, from the SNP so uh, definitely around 
um, supporting neighbouring countries in times of cr crisis, whether it was in the 2015, 2016 so-called European crisis, or on Ukraine. And, and there we see the narrative of Scotland being more pro-immigration, really following through into, you know, into policy when Scotland became a super sponsor for Ukrainians. So... Um, that certainly, the point you're making certainly is borne out in the narrative analysis as well. Okay, now there's a gentleman further forward here with a, a kind of greyish, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm terrible at colours, my wife will tell you, but I think we've got the point. Yes, excellent. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, thanks uh, very much for that, it's really interesting. Uh, one of the things that I want to know is, have you thought about asking people in Scotland what their understanding of migration as historically and in other words have you asked people about their family's experience of migration you know migration to Canada Australia whatever and does that color the way that people actually think about migration in Scotland and does that affect you know the results of your survey Sergey do you want to pick that up at all yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I'm, I'm afraid I haven't been looking at these uh, topics specifically, but it's definitely a hypothesis that has been rehearsed in the academic literature. For example, uh, in the Spanish context as well, no? Spain, despite massive immigration inflows, despite going through a tremendous 2008 crisis and aftermath, everything you can imagine, all the ingredients to have a terrible politics of immigration and a big uh, anti-immigrant sort of like electoral space, but then Spain doesn't have it. And then there's a thousand hypotheses behind it, but one of them is that, no? It's because, you know, it's been a country with a, with a long history of out-migration, and therefore yeah. Yeah. people always have relatives, people have stories, uh, you know, that have been on the table during dinner, and therefore you kind of sympathize with that, with that sort of migration. So I'm afraid I don't have the evidence to support that, but it's definitely a very plausible hypothesis yeah. Yeah. And, and a great line of research. Yeah, it kind of in a sense, it can make sense that if you live in a country which for years has suffered net outward migration. If all of a sudden your country becomes popular, you might think this is something to be proud of. I and mean, certainly uh, the reaction in Ireland to, until the financial crash is to weigh in the Ireland, you know, which of course, even more so than Scotland has suffered a lot of net outward migration. All of a sudden it was becoming a place to which people were migrating to. Um, you certainly saw a, a relatively for a while favorable reaction there. But does anybody here want to pick up? I don't know, it may, maybe picking up on that, because I think it, it's an interesting hypothesis. I haven't seen conclusive research on it, but it no. could go either way as well. So, sure. so I think on the one hand, you could get a tendency, and I've heard, for example, Italian migration scholars talk about, well, of course, you know, southern Italy is more tolerant or whatever because of this history of out-migration and so on. Um, but also you do get evidence of migrant communities who, if I can use the phrase, pull up the ladder, but there is, there, there is also... Uh, can be a tendency to say, well, look, we've made it now, and actually we'd like to sort of protect what we've ah, earned. Oh, that's, uh, oh, and, sure. Uh, well, look, you know, so, there, so there, there, there are some the, very the, prominent you know, UK politicians yeah, okay, who we I might wish to I didn't want to mention, I didn't want to go there, John, but okay, so, so there is, there, there can be that tendency as well. But I would also distinguish between, in a sense, I think what our questioner alluded to was almost a sort of direct familial uh, or lived experience or, or sort of inexperience via close connections and relatives. And that can be sometimes a bit different from a more sort of abstract shared national story. Um, uh, so I think basically when we talk about narratives, it raises really interesting questions about how those develop and what kind of what we'd call intersubjective uh, relationships produce different narratives. Do you derive your narrative from what you read in the national press as opposed to your discussion at the pub on a Friday evening, which is a broader social grouping, as opposed to your direct experience or that of your family. And I think those can create different kinds of narratives and just add to that complexity <laughs> that we keep I think, coming I think back we're, to. We're, we're quietly writing um, Christina's next grant application this <laughs> evening by raising all sorts of difficult questions. Right? There's a gentleman here, and then there's a lady further back. In, in terms of narrative, I, I wondered if you could reflect on the phrase new Scots as used in Scottish government policy, particularly in terms of refugee integration, and either the value of that term, the, the penetration of that term, the uniqueness of that term to Scotland compared, I don't know if there are similar terms uh, in Europe, but it seems to me it captures a, an aspiration for incorporation and non-threat uh, 
Uh, but I wondered what you, you, you thought on it in terms of its comparative value. <laughs> Sir, Sergey, I think, is volunteering to rescue the panel in the room. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question once again. And I think it taps a little bit into that uh, civic construction of Scottish uh, nationalism uh, that very much taps into this relationship with the territorial debate. No, Once again, uh, in Catalonia, they also advocated for the new Catalans. So it seems to be a, re a, a recurring theme in this sort of like... Uh, uh, places with strong center periphery conflicts. No? So I think that this goes back to the initial question of uh, essentially uh, why is it that a strong sort of like Scottish uh, national identity correlates so prominently now with pro-immigration narratives. And I think that, you know, once again, I think it goes back to this idea that in a context of confrontation, again, when, when the English, so to speak, is the other, then you see the new com a potential newcomer that doesn't come from England as an ally in that identity struggle. No? And this has a sincere, but also a strategic component. No? Then there's a different uh, but related theory behind this uh, new Scott construction or, or behind this alliance between Scottish nationalism and, 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 and immigrants, so to speak, which is that after all, the narrative of a, of a peripheral nationalism, if you want to call it like this, uh, is very much based on minority rights. No? So, you know, uh, for the Catalans, they fight for the right to speak Catalan and to have their Catalan things. And Scotland, of course, uh, wants to, you know, the Scottish nationalist movement wants to advocate the right uh, of this minority within the UK to decide its own future and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then this narrative of minority rights gets extended, so to speak, to other minorities, in this case, also migrants. So, so this could be one potential uh, explanation behind that. Okay, there's a lady towards the back there who had a question. In the, in the green top, yeah. Hi, um, Rebecca Kay. I also work for Migration Policy Scotland. Um, I had a question since we're on narratives uh, for Saskia, because I was really interested in your finding around the key protagonists in the media narratives being the politicians. And I think you had a graph where you were showing the salience of migration increasing, but also a graph showing a big spike in kind of media narratives, which I'm assuming uh, are coming from some of those protagonists being particularly controversial recently in, in what they're saying about migration. And I wonder how far you see that as being something that's also driving those public attitudes and that increased salience, and whether that is then something that we see differently in Scotland for whatever the reasons are, that the political narratives are different, that then there's not that, that relationship happening in the same way. So that was my yeah. question. Can I add a little supplementary to that? Should we be surprised that the principal protagonists are politicians? You tell me. I mean, uh, I don't know. Should we? I mean, I think, I think you've, you've sort of half answered your own question, but that's essentially what I was alluding to on my slides when I was trying to bring it bring it back to Scotland. Yes, I do think it's key. I do think, you know, when you have a, a statement like David Cameron's statement about a swarm of migrants coming to the UK, that is then, it was actually repeated more in The Guardian than any other newspaper as a criticism of the rhetoric being used by a senior politician or by a prime minister at the time. Uh, but, but that process still meant that it was, you know, on the front page or, you know, in the first 10, 10 pages of The Guardian, consecutively over weeks coming up again and again every time the immigration issue in some context was being mentioned and we're talking the, the peak of the crisis in 2015 that autumn uh, uh, it, it being reiterated which does suggest that that narrative that idea that there are hordes at the gates that we are being invaded uh, uh, you know is being disseminated it's being perpetuated and I do think that is key and and I, and I think there is something to suggest that that because we do not have Scottish politicians out in the media in front of cameras making these these sort of highly divisive statements that it's not politicized uh, and therefore people don't see it as a, as a, a defining issue for them I mean, Christina and I, can I quickly add as well, um, also what, what came out of your presentation was that interesting lull in political activity and noise over the summer recess and how that provides space for the media to start setting the agenda. And actually, when the media sets the agenda, we sometimes actually get a more, more pro-migrant uh, 
narrative coming through as we did in you know around the 2015 uh, incident and also around Ukraine and we actually found that across our European case studies as well uh, that, that that when politicians aren't taking the platform the media can set the narrative more prominently so I think that that's that's a really really interesting finding actually we assume that the, the media are the baddies but actually the media are very much picking up on the political uh, discourse. Okay, we've got two or three minutes left maximum. So there's a gentleman here, and there's a gentleman here, there's a gentleman at the back. Can we just take all three questions and then in time-honored fashion, you can, between you, choose which ones to answer? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, actually, after what Saskia was saying, I, I thank you, Christina, for um, saying that the, uh, there isn't a kind of uh, actually uniform media, um, speaking as a former Guardian journalist. Um, a... Um, but on the, why is it so easy, in a way, to weaponize uh, this issue in south of the border? And notably, actually, inside the Conservative Party, rather like the Trumpian uh, Republican Party in the, in the States, including by second-generation uh, migrant politicians. I can think of three very highly prominent uh, okay. politicians there. <laughs> why is, whereas here, it's unimaginable that either the uh, First Minister or indeed the leader of the Labour Party. Okay, so, so, so why is it a weaponized issue south of the border? The gentleman here, and then there was one further back as well. Yeah, there's a gentleman there, it's about two or three rows from the far back as well, but there's a gentleman here first. Thank you. I wanted to ask what the panel uh, thought the impact of, if we end up with a Labour government in Westminster this year, um, what that would be on Scottish, the Scottish public's uh, attitudes towards immigration, given that often... Uh, we we kind of think of this Scottish exceptionalism as being in contrast to this okay. imposed okay. conservative. Brilliant, right. Will Labour make a difference to Scotland? And there was a gentleman right in the back there. Just on the issue of politicisation, I just wonder if there's any sense of an absence of political incentives in Scotland to go for to go for this, given the, the dominance of so goes Glasgow, so goes Scotland, as far as elections go, and that being the the, the base of both you know, historical Irish immigration, but also also um, sort of Bangladesh and, and East Asia. So I just wonder whether there's a, a lack of, of that. But I also touched on the, the Irish example of where the hidden narratives are. We saw in Ireland a, a horrible incident that resulted in, in some extreme responses uh, in, the, in the right-wing media. And you only need to look at the comments pages of the social media in Scotland to see similar around issues in my own area of housing and, and homelessness to see there is a virulent anti-immigrant uh, okay. narrative. So just that political incentive All right. absence in Scotland. Thanks very much. So you've got one minute each. Answer as many of those questions as you do or do not wish to do so in any other remarks you want to make. Can I start with Saskia at the far end? Okay, so how is it, why is it so divisive? How has it become so divisive? I mean, this wasn't something we looked at in the research, but one of the findings was that we found that a lot of the dominant narratives, both in political debate and in the media, really... Uh, were built on long-held ideas and discourses on immigration in this country. And we're talking about the idea of a deserving or an undeserving immigrant, an idea of an immigrant being a criminal or being a drain on society. Going back to the 1905 Alien Act, that language is in that. So there's this, you know, there's this idea that, that these are not new narratives. They are, they are maybe strategically deployed, adapted, changed, maybe a different policy solutions are proposed. But a lot of the long long-standing discourses are really occurring and coming around again and again. Okay, Sergey. Final yes, thoughts. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, if I could pick up on the Labour uh, question, I, I suppose it will depend on, on what Labour does uh, 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 and says about the issue, which, which we still don't fully know. Um, so um, it, it could be that it might weaken this very strong correlation that we see now between immigration attitudes and national identity, because at the moment, the alignment is very strong, no? like the Scottish identity, pro-immigration versus the English conservative, pro-Brexit, anti-immigration. Mm -hmm. So depending on how Scott, uh, Labour positions itself and how ambiguous or, or Scottish specific its narrative will be, that relationship, that realignment might weaken. And um, finally, on the last question, the politicization question, again, a great question. Uh, I think the gentleman might be right that there's an absence of, of incentives now to politicize the issue, but this doesn't tell us about what's going to happen in the future. There's okay. nothing written in stone, so we should we should see. Okay, thanks, Sergey. Sarah. 
Um, well, just to follow on from Sergey's point, I mean, I think it's, you know, yes, yes, there's a lack of political incentive. That doesn't mean there will always be a lack of political incentive or that there's in some way that this is a given in Scotland. I think, I think one of the things I would want to reflect upon in relation to the attitude survey results that we have is, is actually that they're remarkable, um, that we've had in the last 20 years, you know, through free movement, Scotland has had the highest pace of, cha of growth of its migrant population proportionately. And that actually, that, and that's correlating with still, con, you know, consistently actually this this level of positivity, where we are seeing also. I thought that final slide about attitudes towards diversity, when you consider that in a context where you know almost close to half the people are actually not living in that context, this is this is really quite. It's remarkable, but it's not a given. And I think in that, I want to kind of circle back to the new Scots not as a rhetorical device, but also just to comment from a policy perspective. I think it's interesting to have a new Scots strategy, but it is for asylum seekers and refugees, and it would be great if that, you know, some of the thinking about how we approach migration, how we integrate migration, how we try to secure, you know, a, a broadly benign conversation around migration is something um, that we should be considering more widely in relation to migration okay. and not just in relation to asylum seekers okay, and thank refugees. You. Christina, you have the last word. Oh, my very goodness, briefly, the pressure. Please. So I, I just wanted to come back to the weaponized question because that goes to the heart, I okay. think, of some of the discussion this evening and just say, and in fact, we were discussing this earlier before the event, uh, and why is it rational, quote, in terms of electoral maximizing electoral gain for the Tories to be weaponizing this issue? And the answer is potentially not. Uh, because, you know, and I think as you pointed out, John, and you have a, will have a great answer to this question, uh, it, it's probably responding more to, to sort of core Tory members than it is to wider population and, uh, you know, concerns in the wider electorate. Um, and that's also partly because the dynamic of competition with far right parties, and we see that across Europe where centre right parties try to capture and compete capture that issue and compete with far-right parties, it doesn't typically go well. It also might be a function of the media and the fact that some of the popular or populist media uh, is, is playing very strongly on these issues, and I think that does influence perhaps the Conservative Party disproportionately. Now, does that mean it will yield electoral success? May, may well not. Uh, and, but, uh, and I think just as a final point, maybe, to end with this insight, which might be a sort of positive thing to, to reflect on, that it's actually interesting that where you do get that level of focus on anti-immigration approaches and you still see public opinion actually shifting towards a more uh, tolerant or positive uh, uh, set of views towards immigration, it actually shows that there is a, a capacity of populations to sort of withstand and hold their ground on issues despite constant repeated okay. lobbying. Um, so I think that's, that's right. a nice, thank you. nice note to end on. Right, thank you, Christina. Well, I'm two minutes away from being turned into a pumpkin. Um, <laughs> Can I first of all say thank you very much to the Royal Society for Edinburgh for organising this event. Uh, thanks above all yourselves, both here and online, for listening. But of course, we have to thank in particular, and I would inv invite you to, uh, in a moment, to uh, recognise their contribution in the traditional way. So thank you to all four of the speakers for an interesting uh, contribution. Um, I should say that for those of you who have been invited, and I'm sorry, it's nothing to do with me as to who is and who isn't invited, um, but there is a private drinks reception afterwards in the Scott room, and you will doubtless be uh, directed in the right direction by the staff if you don't know where that is. So uh, can I invite you, please, to say, uh, uh, show your appreciation to the speakers this evening. And, and with that, I uh, wish you the best of the remaining of the evening, and thank you all very much for being here.